Listener Production. Welcome back to Real Crime. This is part two of my interview with underworld survivor Kelly Carter-Bell. She shows me a picture. It's Kelly at age eight in 1976. She's at home, lounging on the lap of a tall man in his early 30s. He wears a smart brown suit and a crisp white shirt with cufflinks. There are sideburns and a neat comb over. This is no crook. It's like he stepped out of a 70s cop show. It's her father, a detective with Victoria Police. Kelly's grinning and totally relaxed, like she's just run in from school and jumped on her dad's lap. He's also at ease, but there's just the faintest hint of a smile. There's a sadness in his gentle face, a longing. Maybe it's disappointment. He seems to be conveying this down the lens direct to the person taking the picture, Kelly's mum. He was about to leave Kelly's life for good, though she didn't know it. Abandoned by her policeman father, Kelly believed the underworld was her destiny. At age 19, Kelly met and fell in love with John Marshall, and the most dire years of her life were just ahead. Let's talk about John. He yep. was the major relationship in your life. Yep, father of my four children. Yeah, how did you meet him? So Sissy, Tammy and Kerry were in Pentridge and they could see the guys over in the other yard and talk to them and have relationships with them. And Sissy was involved with a guy named who was had been moved to Bendigo Prison and John was a very good mate of his and they sent me up there to see them and yeah I ended up going up to Bendigo Prison to see Mark and yeah met his mate John. John Marshall was a low-level crook, a failed armed robber with a predilection for raping women. He'd served time for that before meeting Kelly. He was one of the Heidelberg rapists um, that did some horrific things to young girls. In 1977, when Marshall was just 20, he and others were convicted over a string of brutal rapes in Melbourne's east. But I was told that um, all them girls were liars and one of their fathers was a copper who wanted them all in jail. And he was in jail for armed robbery. And who was I to go and research that, you know? That's when I was hanging around the Jika Jika, hanging around the big time. It was exciting. I didn't know any different. You know, my sisters were still alive at that stage. That's what I thought life was about. You did what your man said. You stood by him. Like I said, he threatened me if I ever left him, what he'd do to me. And, yeah, I just stuck by like any of us women in that world usually did. So John was more of a um, an emotional abuser. John didn't hit me a lot until he tried to kill me. So hence to the domestic violence factor that a lot of times the first physical abuse is murder. In our day and age, it's very common for the first physical violence is murder. There's a lot of the coercive controlling, you know, there's some... Um, I, had, I ended up having four children under four to John. Um, did he rape you? Yes, he certainly did. And, and, and many there, there, other there women. Was no, there was no yes or no, it was no just way. what he wanted. Yeah. yeah, you know. Yep, I had my first daughter at 19 and unfortunately she's in heaven. What happened? Uh, she had hydrocephalus. So, water on the brain? Yep. Yeah, he'd just had a shootout with police, um, with Henry trying to do an armed robbery on a, um, a truck. Ended up in the St Vincent's Hospital in the police ward there. And, you know, it was all, how are we going to get him out? How isn't he guilty? Let's get married. <laughs> Next thing, here's me all done up to the nines. I got some beautiful photos of myself um, going into Pentridge to marry this man. And, like, I went all out. 
you know, the big diamond. I've got the diamond in my tooth now. Yeah, I can see it's uh, glittering. Yeah. In the, you, so that's, that's your engagement <laughs> yeah, ring. Yeah, that sure that is. That you've, you've now set in your left hand. Yes, thank you. I wasn't wasting that. Um, I paid for that. <laughs> he was in jail. I paid for the whole wedding. Worked really hard. Worked three jobs. So this was your dream? Yeah. Four children. He's he's not been bashing you through these years. Just the emotional, you fat, lazy fucking bitch. What have you been doing all day? Bringing up four kids under four, having the dinner on the table at a certain time. Um, he he worked about fifteen hour days, um, and I brought up the children. Whatever home life Kelly had made for her kids fell apart in 1987, when Marshall and his friend Henry Morhan murdered a man named Mick Brennan. Why? Because he'd stole some jewellery off um, Henry's missus. And the guy was still gurgling in the back of the car and they got pulled over by the coppers and they turned the radio up so they couldn't hear him. And they dumped him at the back of the flats that I was living in in Fitzroy. So John um, and Henry Morhan were charged with a murder a long time after they did the murder. And John come home that night and told me what they'd done. And I had to carry that. I had to be the wife and keep my mouth closed and had to keep us safe, if that's the word, because if I talk, our family's going down. My husband's going to jail for a long time. And when I look back now, I don't know if I love John. It was more fear. But, yeah, I I had to carry that for a long time. Did you think about ratting him out? Definitely not. You didn't? No way. Oh, in the end, yes, but not not when I was under his rule because he told me that if I ever left him, he would beat me down below so I'd never be able to have sex again and he'd cut my lips off so another man would never look at me. Kelly kept quiet. Ironically, it was Marshall who went to the cops in the end. He ended up going Crown Witness against Henry Morhan for the murder of Mick Brennan. Before he went Crown Witness, he thought he could protect us all fucking terrifying. I just, we moved house from Frankston to Mornington and he was still going to court with Henry, but no one had known he was talking just yet. And I just obeyed, I suppose, in the end. And not only is he a career criminal, he's now a dog. Yes. He's not a good crook, he's now the lowest form in the underworld. Yeah, yeah, And that puts you at risk as well. Oh, yeah. His self-esteem is crashing, I imagine, at this point. I don't think he's got a heart, mate, or he had a heart. I don't think he had self-esteem. So... Now it gets almost fatal for you. What happened? When when we moved to Queensland, I remember if I used to see a car with a Victorian number plate, I would dead set sleep that night about Henry finding me and chopping me up in little pieces and posting me back to John. That's how I used to think I'd be taken off this planet like that. I thought Henry would get me, torture me and, you know, that would be the end for me. And that went on for God... Eight years? Yeah. Henry Morhan was convicted of the murder, but Marshall was free after giving up his mate. Kelly knew she had to get away from John and that there would be consequences. I had the four kids under four and we'd been separated for about 11 months. He used to have the children some weekends and I met a lovely man. And the kids were very young and um, happened to mention the man that I was, I was seeing somebody. And wow, shit got scary then. He started threatening me. This was just after Father's Day. I'd bought him, I was working by then, bought him a lovely set of clothes, you know, from the kids. Uh, In the end, for about six weeks, he told me that he was going to cut my lips off so another man would never look at me. He told me what he'd do, what he'd wear, how he'd do it, where he'd do it. Um, He had my older children, James and Paris, for three weeks and wouldn't give them back to me. And... My belief was he's hurting me, he's not hurting the kids. So the kids love him. They should be able to see their dad. So it come to the week before, he, he, with my son James, went to my house when he knew I was working, cut up all my clothes, come to my workplace at a Westfield shopping town, slashed my car tyres, and then I took an intervention order out on him. So this was the first time in... A lot of years of abuse, you'd ever called the police? Yep. Yeah. Big step. Ever. 
I called the police. Um, I went to a refuge. Um, still wanted to go to work because little Miss Independent here, hey, you're not stopping me from doing anything, you know. I've got a life and I'm going to live it. Saturday the 4th of January, uh, 1986, I seen him come into the store. He was wearing what he told me he'd wear. I noticed that he had something spilt down the front of him and the front of his shirt was untucked. And he was coming towards me and he said, we need to talk about these charges. And I said, you know, what charges? I've just put an intervention order on you so you can't do what you want. Um, So he led me to this back corner. The next thing I know, uh, he grabbed me by the hair, pulled a filleting knife out of his jeans and started slashing me. And I have scars from head to toe. As I've showed you, this is four cuts on my face. The main One from your right ear or to yep. your lip line, yep. basically. And as you can see, there's probably a centimetre before that could have hit my temple. Yep. This is all over your body? Yes, I've got huge scar down my back, um, little stab marks here, big one on my bum. All from that moment? Yes. Yeah. How long did this go for? Two minutes. But what I did, Adam, was... So the grass matting the floor was made of. And coir I, matting, yeah. Yeah, coir matting. What I did was I grabbed that with my teeth because he was slashing at my face and that's why he turned to the rest of my body because he couldn't get my head up anymore. Um, you're not ruining this smile, buddy, I was thinking. No chance. Um, but then he started stabbing himself. So, Mr John Marshall stabs himself three times. Dumb fucker couldn't even do that right. Third one hit the sternum. But believe it or not, I was up and when he started doing that, I went to run and help him. And I can remember my boss screaming, Callie! And I I don't know what happened. Something hit and then I turned around and I run. I had a beautiful white dress on that was red. Back in the day, the only thing that could help me was a cleaner coming with a disposable nappy to put on my face. I got out of there. They took me to the store next door. Okay, so ambulance come. The copper comes that put the intervention order on him and he'd been in the store next door, come in and said he's going to die. His eyes are rolling back. Fuck, and that didn't happen. They take me to the same hospital as him until I think he was moved or the ambulance relayed, don't bring him here, Kelly's going to that hospital. But anyway, the doctor saved his life. The next weekend in the local paper, the Courier Mail, a double spread um, right up on how they'd saved this man's life. Not one mention of me. Not one mention, just the amazing job they'd done to save this man's life. Yeah, so... Why didn't he kill you? (sighs) Can't kill me. I'm too good for that, mate. I'll go when I'm ready. Just not Do you think he might have wanted you to live with this disfigurement? Maybe. Went back to work the next week. And as you can see, the scar on my face is beautiful and you can hardly see it. The doctor that sewed me up had just done a year in plastic surgery so it just looked like I'd been sewn up by a sewing machine didn't bother me did not bother me in the slightest you know I wanted to get back to my norm it was just another chapter in the book get knocked down you get back up again what's that get knocked down seven times get up eight eight. yeah yeah (laughs) I've been knocked down I think 23 I got up 24 yeah (laughs) was he the last bad man No. He wasn't, was he? No. So after, I think, yeah, it was 96, by 2000, I was with my next partner, the father of my fifth child. I was 32. He was 20. Very good-looking man, kid, scumbag. And I stayed with him for the next six years and he tormented my children and I. Um... 
for that period and I haven't been with him for 15 years and he's in jail now for probably beating the 15th woman after me, which brings me to say they don't change, you have to. But what would make you change after all this, Kelly? As a listener, I'm wondering how the hell does this story come out? You look fantastic today. How on earth did you get to a moment where the turning point was reached? Yep. So once again, we'd been out for dinner. He was working as a landscape gardener. With this guy, I probably had two black eyes every couple of weeks, one if I was lucky. We'd gone out to Crown with the work company and apparently I was looking at someone else and we'd had an argument and I didn't live far from Crown and come home and went to bed. He'd come home a little while later, I opened the door, bang, bang, KO'd on the floor, two black eyes. And I woke up the next day and I was looking in the mirror and thinking, I'm sure this isn't what life's about. I'm sure I deserve more and there's more to life than this. And that was the start, but I still put up with that relationship for the next two years until I just kept working on myself um, and sort of understanding I have to break the cycle for these kids. Do I want my girls to be coming home with black eyes and my boys to be beating people? I don't know who taught me. I think it was just me. I think it was just, um, yeah. Can I say that I'm a really strong, courageous lady? Does it come from there? Does it come from what I've been through and I don't want it to happen again? Does it come to, you know, my children deserve better? But Adam, when this man left me, I tried to kill myself, literally. This is what these narcissists do to you. I literally took an overdose and tried to kill myself. I cried for hours and hours, probably days when he left. I had a light bulb moment thinking, I have to break the cycle. How dare me try and take my life from my kids? How fucking dare me? What right do I have? And that was 15 years ago. And like we've discussed, I still struggle every goddamn day, but I will never go backwards. The only way is up. And that's what I'm showing my children. It's not perfect. How did you make the day-to-day change? God, that was hard. God, that was hard. There was days there when I would be ringing him, begging him back. It's taken me, it took me about 10 years and I did a self-development forum. Did you have therapy? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen a psychiatrist for 10 years and that's when I had the light bulb moment that what the boys in the flats used to do to me, what all these guys have done to me wasn't my fault, was not my fault. Yeah, they did that to me, I didn't do that to them. I was just looking for love. That's all I wanted was to be loved still to this day. And I was doing a self-development course and it goes over three days and I actually forgive John for trying to kill me. Nothing to do with John. John never knew about this, but it was one of the best days of my life because I started forgiving myself for what I'd put my children through. You know, I grew up in a zoo with animals and am I going to do that again? Am I going to be going to visit my kids in jail? What's happened since? Um, I still don't have a man that loves me, (laughs) but that's fine because I love myself um, and that's very important. That took... Up until I probably did that, I had the chance to rewire my brain um, through NLP and... NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Yes, yes, you tell me. (laughs) (laughs) I know I rewired my brain. So I'm an ambassador for a couple of organisations to do with domestic violence um, and I won a course that rewired my brain worth about $12,000 and I forgive myself for my parenting and I love myself. So I've got five children and number five grandchild on the way. Who wouldn't want to stay on this earth and change things for them? Yeah. 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 Who Are you done with love? Oh, definitely not. I don't know what it is. Don't know what it is. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm looking. Yeah. So. Now, the one who outlives all these assholes is the winner. Yes. And I've outlived a few. That <laughs> fascinates me. It really does. Just um, listening to your podcasts and the people you talk about, I've had to, dealings with a lot of them and none of them are here. And What happened to John? Uh, <laughs> John died of karma and cancer. Yeah. yeah. Right. Eat him to death, I hope, yeah. uh, in the nicest way. As I said, he's- Karma-related cancer. Yes. 
He deserves to be where he is. He's in limbo, just watching me succeed and his children succeed. Yeah. And never being able to be a part of it. No, that's right. Yeah. You know, just watching me get stronger and stronger every day. And, you know, I wear my scars with pride. Thank you. You know, my scars beautiful. And you never wipe this smile off my face. The key to Kelly's future is resolving the past. And that means making contact with her policeman father. It wasn't until I was probably 40-something that I got that my dad left because he loved me. And that was the light bulb. That's what I needed. So dad didn't leave because he didn't love me. He left because he loved me. So I'm a lovable human being? Huh? How does that work out? And I'm 52 (laughs) and I don't know what it feels like to be loved by a male, but that's going to happen. One lucky man is going to get me. Yeah. It's all about your dad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think we should do this. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, I wonder, why haven't you to this point? I just was angry and thought he didn't deserve me, I think. Kelly had relied entirely on her mother and her version of the breakup with her father, some of which didn't really add up especially the story about her dad's nervous breakdown. Mum told me that he had to have shock treatment after he had the nervous breakdown and he wouldn't remember me. But I've sort of researched a little bit of that and I think even with shock treatment back in the days, you wouldn't forget your eight-year-old daughter. I don't think so. No, no. You're unforgettable. Yeah, thank you. I think so too. Once you meet me, I I tend to leave a mark on people and, and that's a good mark. Now I had no choice but to find Kelly's father. Fortunately, she had quite a bit of information to start me off. I went to contemporaries from Victoria Police in the 70s who remembered him. Bazza, as he was known, had left the force in the mid-70s and moved to Perth, where he remained involved in legal administration. A few more calls and I had a telephone number. It answered. Kelly's father was alive. The next phone call was one of the most enjoyable I've ever made. Okay, now we're going to call Kelly and see what she has to say about this. Can you do it? Hello? Can you do it again? I'll press the red button. Can you do it again? Okay? Yeah, whatever. Absolutely. Oops. Not sure what happened then. Let's try again. Hello? Hello, Adam. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. What's been happening? Oh, not much. I'm just having, I've got the granddaughter for a couple of days because my daughter's going to have another baby, grandchild number five. Right. You're going to have heaps. My goodness. I am, aren't I? That's what happens when you start at 19, mate. Yeah, well done. Yes. It frightens me, the thought. Hey, listen, um, uh, how do I say this? I found him. (gasps) Oh, my God. (laughs) Is he alive? Yeah, he is. I just spoke to him. I said that you just want to communicate somehow, and he asked for your mobile number. Yes. So it's positive. Oh my God, Adam, that's so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I just feel like I'm worth something. Does that make sense? Thank you so much. Yeah, that's no, right. <laughs> She probably haven't had a reaction like that. <laughs> well, normally when women cry at me, it's because I've done something bad. You know, but... This is the happiest day of my life. <laughs> but, well, you, you, you've had some ordinary ones, so I'm glad to be here on a good one. There was no telling at this stage whether Kelly's father would make contact, but I had a good feeling. Man, I think this is going to be great. Hopefully. At least we got this far, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, my God. You're a fucking legend, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you, Thank Kelly. You, mate. I'll talk to you later, darling. You. Well, that's got to warm your heart, doesn't it? How often do you get the chance to be a part of that? It all depends now what does. A few days later, I had the answer. Yeah, I spoke to him. <laughs> How'd it go? Yeah, amazing. We spoke for 36 minutes. 
And the first thing he said to me, which I was really surprised, is I loved your mother so much. There was one more twist, this time for me. It turns out the man I'd found, I had in fact met several years earlier. And he did some work with you years back. With me? Yeah. Did you live in Perth at all? I did. Yeah. He said he did some work with you years ago. On what? I don't know. I'm not sure what. How bizarre. Kelly's father told her that he'd been keeping tabs on her. He said he's known who I was for a few years, Adam. I see. Yeah. So he said his brother did a big family tree a few years ago. Okay. And so he, what was his position on contacting you after that? Um, He just wasn't sure how to go about it. I see. Yeah, but he's watched a few of the things I've done and read the article and things like that. So it looks like the way is open to, you know, form a relationship, Kelly. Yeah, yeah, and he said, who knows, one day we might finish this podcast together with Adam. And did he say why you left? Yeah, because he'd said to me there was never a bad word between your mother and I. There was never swearing, there was never yelling. I just think it was mum's drinking. Because I did say she was a very bad drunk, wasn't she? And he said, yes, that was her downfall. Kelly now understands that her mother could have told a self-serving version of her dad's absence from her life. Okay, so it wasn't the discovery of their relationship then as you believed? No, no. Maybe mum just made that up, so that's what I thought. And Um. he did say that he told my mum he was moving to Western Australia. Oh, well, it's a lot of questions (laughs) answered. Yes. In, yes. in 36 minutes? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how are you feeling? I don't know. How do I word it? Like, I don't want to go to sleep because I'm scared I'll wake up and it won't be true. <laughs> but this is the turning point in my life where as good things do happen. With that, I'm going to leave father and daughter to reacquaint themselves. There's a lot of history to catch up on. Thank you so much. Oh, my dear. Okay. okay. Thank you, Adam. Bye. Bye. This has been a Real Crime production. Written and produced by Adam Shand. Executive producer, Grant Tothill. Mixing, editing and theme music by Matt Nikolic. Associate producer, Matt Dwyer. Additional editing by Kelly Falston. Research by Nolly Way Shand. Digital producers, Jack Shand and Oscar Gordon. Listener.